Welcome home, everyone. It is a pleasure to have you with us on this Thursday. Thank you for taking time out to spend it uh, with me here in a locked up LA. Always appreciate it. We have so much to get through today. Um, we're going to start with these attacks. Um, launched by the U.S. against the WHO, um, attacks centered on uh, the U.S. president's uh, belief, or certainly claim that um, the world body did not act in a timely manner um, in terms of shaping its response to the coronavirus. My friend and former CNN colleague Zane Vergy is with us to break that all down for us. And as we talk about the WHO's response and how it's coming under attack, we're also going to talk about the whole business of messaging and communication. How do you communicate communicate in, in this moment and specifically how do we effectively communicate this threat in Africa? We'll have a communications expert with us to talk about that. Um, plus, I want you to start sending me your questions. Um, obviously, conversation communication is the name of the game here. And one of the things that is sharply um, in focus right now is the amount of bad information that's out there right now. Um, the, the social media website struggling to keep up with, with, with their attempts to, to get it off their platforms. So we will have a friend of the show, uh, Dr. Nicolette Lewis-Saint, with us to answer your questions so we can give you the right information. So start those questions, get typing, send them along to me as soon as you can, and we'll get them answered for you in the next hour. And we have an inspirational story for you to um, end today's show we feel that we should also just spotlight for you the people who are doing incredible things in this moment, um, details that we should all know about and be proud of. So let's get started. All right. So let, let's start with this issue of the WHO. U.S. President uh, Donald Trump has been lashing out at the organization for what he says is their poor handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is what he tweeted on Tuesday. Let me read this to you. He says the WHO really blew it. For some reason, funded largely by the United States, yet very China-centric. We'll be giving that a good look. Fortunately, I rejected their advice on keeping our borders open to China early on. Why did they give us such a faulty recommendation? Hmm. Well, clearly, finger pointing is the name of the game. Uh, the U.S. president's attacks on the WHO come against this backdrop of Trump himself being under fire here in the United States for his own personal decision making when it comes to the coronavirus. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on here that we want to break down for you. As he launches these attacks, the WHO boss, Dr. Tedros, is not staying silent. He is pushing back strongly and defending the actions taken by the WHO and these claims that they did not act in a timely manner. He spoke at a media briefing in Geneva on Wednesday, and uh, not only did he defend his organization, he also warned against the politicizing of this virus. He said it was, quote, playing with fire. Take a listen to what else he had to say. I can tell you personal attacks that has been going on for more than two, three months. Abuses. or racist comments, giving me names, black or negro. I'm proud of being black or bl proud of being negro because that negro is black, black is black, and I'm proud. I don't care, to be honest. And thank you for asking that question. Maybe for the first time I would make this public even death threat, I don't give a damn. Mm. The WHO chief there, Dr. Tedros, saying for the first time that he's received the, the, a death threats, personal attacks on him since this uh, pandemic got underway. Um, astounding, really, when you would take a minute to just to fully process that. Um, African leaders are rallying around him in his moment of need. Uh, I want to talk about all of that in great depth and get some perspective from friend of the show. And uh, again, I'd like to introduce her as the smartest person I know. Zane Verdi joining me from Lockdown LA. Welcome. Hi, Aisha. Good to be with you always. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, even though you're not wearing your specs today. <laughs> 
Let's talk about this situation. So let, let's start with the, the, the basic situation here that Trump um, and others in his administration, including Pompeo, Secretary of State, saying that the WHO moved too slowly and gave bad advice. You've been following this story. Is there any truth to what has been said to these allegations that are being made? So, you know, what we really have to do here when you're looking at fact and fiction and the politicization and the lack of quarantining um, these kind of allegations and and, and basically um, using it for political gain, when you actually look at the timeline on what WHO did and did not do is really at the core here and what Donald Trump did and did not do. And what it shows is, is that very early on, sometime in January, early January, when this when reports started to surface from China, the WHO did take China a little bit at face value and, and did accept China's numbers and said, okay, well, China's handling this. Um, much later, we then learned that China's been covering this up. Now, did the WHO know? Uh, they say absolutely not. They were just taking the information as it was coming to them, and they were doing their own investigation. Now, around um, mid-February, WHO by themselves hardened things up, and they were like, listen, China, we're coming in. We need to send a team of scientists to see what exactly is going on, right? Because a few weeks prior to that, China was saying, well, there's no human-to-human -human transmission. You know, that's not what coronavirus is. So the WHO you know, took very definitive steps to understand what the facts really are, right? So that's number one. Uh, the second thing is, they're, they're a collection of, of member states that make up the World Health Organization. And so if the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe, and, you know, the, the, these main countries are not standing behind WHO going, go fight with China, like, that would be a suicidal mission for, for a UN entity to go and confront China. So... So that's kind of the timeline from the WHO's point of view. Uh, mm. President Trump and, and uh, you know, various senators and, and in the Republican Party have essentially said that uh, Dr. Tedros and the WHO are uh, in the pockets of China and they're China-centric. And as you well know, this is becoming a very uh, heavily political issue in the United States that could cost Donald Trump even an election. This is going to be a referendum on how he's handling coronavirus. So when you look at the timeline of how he behaved and what he said, what he knew, uh, you know, and what the world knew at the time and what we saw, uh, there's 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 a lot that he falls short. So mm -hmm. um, so that that's that's one key thing to consider um, when what 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 China said and what WHO did when they said it. And just to be clear, you know, Trump also, you know. Suggesting, although he's tried to walk it back now, that they would be looking at U.S. funding, U.S. contributions to WHO. I mean, yeah. how significant would that be? You know, particularly at a time like this, right, where you know we're, we're talking about a public health emergency, a global crisis. How significant a blow would it be to WHO efforts to lose um, U.S. funding? How much is it worth in terms of their budget? Yeah, I mean, it would be a major blow. You know, uh, the United States uh, provides about a fifth of the WHO budget. I was actually looking at some of the numbers earlier today, and between 2018 to 2019, the U.S. gave $900 million to the World Health Organization. So, it, it you know, defunding it and putting forward um, a bill uh, in Congress, as, as a bunch of U.S. senators are thinking of doing, mm -hmm. will be extremely damaging. And frankly, and this is my view, I think this would be criminal. Mm -hmm. Right. You do not do something like that in the middle of a global pandemic. And as Dr. Tedros said, you're just going to see more body bags yeah. um, if you politicize you know, a situation like this. The other thing, too, is that if you look at the timing, um, Aisha, at, at the, in January, President Trump had made a, a trade deal with China. Right. Mm -hmm. At the time. So, you know, to push back on China in January would have hurt his own trade deal that he was very happy about and, and that he was touting. So that's something that I'm I'm seeing come up as well as part of the conversation in the timeline. And his own advisors were pretty skeptical I, in January. I was about what to say, was saying, I right? mean, he was, so, getting, he was getting memos, even though he says he didn't look for some of them, didn't see some of them. But certainly within his own administration, there was a conversation about what was playing out in China and what that might mean for the United States. So the sense that he was sitting waiting just for the WHO to shed light on the situation, it, it has been shown to be patently false by information that's emerged from his own administration. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And the bottom line is he's messed up. The country's taking a huge um, economic toll and even greater than that, we're losing lives um, at a scale, you know, that we've never seen before here in in this country. So he messed up. He needs a scapegoat. WHO, Dr. Tedros is a scapegoat. Hillary was a scapegoat. Biden is a scapegoat. Anytime he messes up, you know, uh, there's a scapegoat scenario that occurs. So that is what's happening here. The, you know, if it was a white guy running WHO, I, we wouldn't see racist attacks and maybe he wouldn't be a scapegoat. So mm-hmm. I think the race element okay. is a heavy That's piece here, okay. Aisha. That, that racist element. I mean, we've heard Dr. Tedros mention, you know, some of the abuse um, and, and he's pointed the finger at Taiwan. So talk to me about that and how that fits into this picture. Yeah, I, there is truth to that. Right. Um, and you're seeing it in the way that he reacted. Um, I, I've known him for many years. He's a even keel guy, uh, very cool, calm and collected. And, and for, for him to, to to have a reaction like that, there's a, a very, very it goes very deep to the, where, where the heart of the truth actually lies. So um, that's that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, geopolitics is coming to play into this as well. Right. Not just Trump's reelection, but, you know, Taiwan's fight with China. Yeah. uh, Taiwan is not a member state of the World Health Organization. China claims uh, that uh, it is sovereign over Taiwan. And that's been, as you know, (laughs) over years of covering this, Mm -hmm. you know, a major issue. And so um, it's it's like. Taiwan is teaming up with, uh, you know, Trump over and, and the, the right wing gang here in, in the United States and are orchestrating an anti Tedros campaign uh, with, you know, with a little bit of help from uh, the right wing sides of uh, yeah, Japan and India. Um, and you're seeing, you know, this this on social media in particular, a very negative uh, campaign that they're running, uh, wanting him to step down and, and pushing for defunding. Um, so it's it's serious, right? Um, but the geopolitical piece is is coming heavily into play. So that's that's what you're seeing here with Taiwan. So staying with the geopolitical piece, as Taiwan tries to mount its bid now to to draw attention to the fact that they're they're not able to, to be a member um, because of you know China's sway, which it does have um, over the WHO it, it, to some degree. Um, Africa and mm-hmm. African leaders are also stepping up in this moment to rally around Dr. Tedros. Talk to me about who we're hearing from and, and the comments that are being made. Yeah, they've really come out punching here um, on the side of Dr. Tedros. You know, you've got the chair of the African Union, uh, Musa Faki, coming out and making a statement saying that Tedros is doing an excellent job. And everyone's really staying on the on, on the message that focus on the pandemic, save lives. You know, don't don't start flinging at slinging mud and, and getting into politicizing such a serious issue. You've got Rwanda. Uh, President Paul Kagame uh, put out a tweet saying uh, Dr. Tedros, as leader of the World Health Organization, has the full confidence and support of Africa as we know it. That's an important <laughs> that's an important uh, few words after, you know, after that statement, as we know it. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's a sense of solidarity there. Um, the uh, president um, of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, wrote this. The most potent weapon against COVID-19 and its devastating health, social and economic impact is international cooperation and solidarity, which is why the exceptional leadership displayed daily by WHO and Dr. Tedros during an unprecedented global public health crisis is incalculable. Mm -hmm. So uh, along with uh, President Ramaphosa, you've got the head of uh, Nigeria, Namibia, Ethiopia, all heads of state coming out to say that he's been doing a great job. And in the conversations that I have, notwithstanding any dynamic I have with the WHO, um, you know, he's been doing a pretty good job, is, is the general consensus. Uh, you know, a pandemic is, uh, is, a, is a tough thing by, in, at any moment in time to handle. And Dr. Tedros and his team have been doing a pretty awesome job. And it's great to see the solidarity of the continent behind him. And, and they're rooting for one of the most important uh, jobs in the world right now. Yeah, I know. I, I, I yeah. just want to echo that it is it is phenomenal to see the African leaders rallying and you know yeah. 
you know, forming a united front in this moment as people try and politicize um, this this awful situation to point, score, and deflect from you yeah. know what you're making yeah. in countries. Um, Zane, it's it's always a pleasure. Um, again, I'm so grateful to know you and that big brain of yours. Um, <laughs> come back. Uh, we'll get you back on. <laughs> days when you can squeeze us in thank you thank you you. um i mean they there you have it i mean you heard from from zane and uh giving us some kind of perspective there on the timeline you know really again today is very much about separating fact from fiction so what are the facts of the matter looking at the timeline to see the actions taken by the who um which you know everyone clearly acknowledges this moment is a very difficult one for the organization. But to say, as President Trump has, that the uh, WHO was slow or gave bad information um, is, is not borne out by the facts as laid out. And as we say, we also know that the US administration had their own stream of in- information and intelligence for independent decision making. Um, the comments made by Dr. Chedros speaking about the personal threats that he has faced and the abuse, you know, Zane, as she declared that, knows him personally and said that for him to come out and speak so plainly and forcefully really gets to to the heart of the matter and how troubled he is by all of this. Um, We, of course, are going to continue to follow that story for you very, very closely um, as African leaders rally around um, the WHO boss, um, Dr. Tedros. So, you know, keep keep watching and we'll bring you the latest on that. Switching gears, but really kind of staying in the same lane. Communication. Communication is key. Um, In this moment in time, the ability to effectively convey to people that they must wash their hands, that they must maintain social distancing, could well be the deciding factor in whether we ultimately win this battle against the coronavirus. But we also know that every country is different, has its specific cultural context, its own nuances. So how you communicate to those populations, to each population has to be tailored. The question that I have is how do you effectively communicate to populations in Africa? How do we tailor that message? Um, Who better? To, to ask that question to than a, a communications expert. I'm thrilled to say that Muki Makura joins us now. She joins us from South Africa. She's currently the executive director of Africa with No Filter, um, which focuses on changing the narrative of how the world views Africa. Previously, Muki was with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Muki, welcome. Hi, Aisha, Hi. how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Very, very grateful. Um, before we get to the specific um, mm-hmm. conversation piece of, you know, if communicating during this crisis, this information, I do want to ask you, because I know that you'll have a take on what we're seeing with the attacks on Tedros. And, you know, Zane talked about the element of race playing in, in here. Mm-hmm. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are, because, again, this all plays into narratives, Right. Okay. And I, I do want to see what you make of it. What narrative is trying to trying to be spun here with an African at the head of WHO? How are you reading it? Well, I mean, well, first of all, thanks for having you on the show. But I think um, Zane's absolutely right. Um, it's become almost us and them. It's become a case of the African leaders are joining forces to protect one of their own. And I think it's unfortunate that it's playing out like that, um, because this is at a time like this, and several people have said it, it's not about the fact that Tedros is an African and therefore African leaders, everybody should be coming out to protect or to to agree with what he's been doing or say it's not any good. Trump happens, happens to have his own perspective. Mm-hmm. Maybe people agree with him, but I, I feel that it's becoming a race yeah. issue. And I think that just distracts everybody. But yeah. I guess everybody's looking for new storylines on, on you know, coronavirus. Yeah. And I mean, again, with, with I think, leaders all around the world coming under scrutiny for their actions, mm. everybody's looking mm. to shift attention. I think that, I think that there's that in, in play mm. also. So, so mm. talk to me in terms of, as you see it right now, the narrative around coronavirus and Africa. And and then I want to specifically dive into the question of communication and how and how that's effectively done, because you have a particular view of it. What is the narrative as stands right now? Because I hear a lot of Africa is going to be decimated. Africa is going to 
you know, mm. disappear. Yeah. Talk to me about what's you know, happening I, to you. Yeah, I think one of my, my biggest concerns early on when this sort of started was that Africa seemed to be positioned as the weak link mm-hmm. in everything. Africa was where this thing was going to blow up and it was all going to be down to, you know, to Africa, whether or not we survived or not. I think the reality we're seeing, it's not the case. Africa is mm-hmm. not the weak link. We don't know that for a fact. And there's a lot we don't know about the coronavirus and what's happening. But I think we've been painted as, you know, the weak link. And it's it's a it's a role that Africa has typically had and has always sort of absorbed it and we've done it. But what I have seen, and I'm beginning to sort of, you know, and I, I have to say, you know, there's a few things that I'm enjoying right now. But one of the things is the fact that, you know, we, we saw the, the episode with the two French doctors talking mm-hmm. about rolling out, trialing the vaccine in in Africa. And the outcry, the outcry from Twitter saying, absolutely not. But they were able to do that because they had swallowed this narrative about Africa and Africans having no agency. And to me, the fact that we are fighting back and saying, absolutely no way, I think it's, it's fantastic. Now, if we could just capture that and keep that momentum going every time we saw examples of where people are talking about the content in a way that seems that we don't have agency, we don't kind of care, you can just come and dump your research on us, you can do X with us, uh, that that would be, you know, an absolute blessing out of this, that people actually feel that you know, they can defend the continent. Mm-hmm. I think that would be great. So we're we're speaking on two planes. So there is a whole um, the communication of how African leaders are doing. Also, you know, because they have been, you know, proactive and they they've, they've taken steps to to robustly battle coronavirus. There's that one side which I'm going to come back to. But I, I want to talk specifically in this moment about communicating to. African populations about the mm. risk at hand and how mm. you feel that's that's going on because you know like I said at the beginning there was a specific tailoring that has to happen for for mm. the country in question the region in question what are we getting right and where's the gap I think the thing we are definitely getting right across the world is the public health messaging I think there are very few people who don't understand social distancing, staying at home. Now, whether or not they're adhering to it is where we have to customize, where we have to localize. Because if you think about how communication works, which I'm sure we all do, is that you've got to have insights. For you to receive a message, you have to understand what I'm thinking about right now. And I think that the messaging coming out about the the virus, it's one size fits all. It's They're telling people to wash hands, people who don't have water. How do you wash your hands if you don't have water? Social distancing, how do you do that when you live in a room with 12 other people? So, you know, there is, so we are very successful about communicating this, you know, broader, you know, public health messaging, that's fantastic. But when it comes to how does that apply to me when I live in a room with 12 other people, how do I social distance, really? How do I wash my hands when I don't have, you know, um, what's it called, the the hand hand, hand sanitizer? I don't have water. And that's where I mean that at national level, at global level, I think the messaging is working. But when you drill down down further into communities where these unique, you know, circumstances happen, where they don't have X, they don't have Y, how are we communicating around that? How are we providing alternatives? If you don't have water, this is what you should do, or this is where you must go. How are we doing that? I think that's where we need to do a lot more work. It's at sub-national level, not at global. So talk to me about the answer then. I mean, this is the stuff that you're you're racking your brain with. How, yeah, do, you, yeah. how do you penetrate? How do well, you connect? Yeah, well, I think one of the things we have to look at the platforms people are using, you know, I recently tweeted because I I saw this, that 75% of Africans get their information on Mm COVID-19 on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not 75% of the total African population. That's 75% of the people who have access to digital or or, or data enough to be able to see this stuff on WhatsApp. So for me, that was, okay, you you, you know, you can take that um, piece of data. The point is that if we are only, you know, focusing on mass media, you know, like television, how many people have access to to TV and social media? I mean, really, if you're sitting in a, you know, township or rural area, you are not on Twitter. And again, these are platforms that it's easy for us to you know to to use but i think if you look at if you wanted to you know make sure coca-cola or or you know um there's soap in a particular area or this company is in this particular area they go into the community they do community type of activations you know maybe you can't do that in person but radio i think something like 80 to 90 
percent of the continent who listen to radio. Yeah, Yeah, the challenge with radio is that radio also has a language, um, Mm. you know, challenge. So you're putting content out, you know, in English. And half the people who are listening to English is not their first language. And I actually thought today, because I was listening to Ramaphosa do his his talk, and he's been brilliant. He's been absolutely brilliant about sort of keeping us abreast. Again, that is, that's at a national level, mm-hmm. but he does it in English. South Africa has 11, 11 you know, languages, official languages. So there's a bunch of people who probably don't understand. So there's a role for community radio stations, for radio to actually take that messaging and make it relevant. And beyond that, without looking at um, sort of um, platforms, media platforms, it's about going into those communities. You know, this is probably controversial, but health workers are deemed to be sort of emergency and they have to be out doing what they need to do. A big part of that is communication. And Mm -hmm. I actually think there should be teams of people who are adequately protected going into the communities and telling people what they need to know. Last question before I let you go. Mm. Again, um, everything you've said is, is, is so interesting and so insightful. One thing I do want to ask you about is how we overcome the fear piece in all of this, because that's going to take a specific kind of yeah. nuance. And that very much is in play in, 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 in various countries and in various mm. communities when you drill down. Well, look, I, I I will say, because I sit in a country where thousands of people have died of HIV and there's TB, which is the biggest killer. And to be honest, the reason why people are out on the road and they're not adhering to social distancing is because COVID what? Mm-hmm. You know, I've de- they you know in you know Nigeria we've dealt with Ebola. But in South Africa, they're dealing with HIV, they're dealing with TB. These are the bigger killers in this yeah. country. So when you talk about fear, I think talk about fear of people who have access to all the information because that's mm-hmm. where the fear comes from. When you're yeah. tuning in, you think, yeah, yeah. oh my God, the world is going to end. Maybe it isn't you, enough fear in other places where they don't have access. To absolutely. Go to go to Nigeria, Lagos. People are still doing things that they probably shouldn't be. You know. I, I don't know that that fear that we feel because of that access to so much information about this um, virus. I think a lot of people are probably thinking, don't know what it's all about mm-hmm. in rural areas, poorer communities, because quite frankly, if it was a choice between coronavirus and eating, which is actually the choice people are making, they're going out on the streets because if they don't go out, they don't eat. It's as simple as that. So what are you scared of? And I think we really need to kind of think about those things. And unfortunately for us, we view everything through the lens that we have. You know, I can only tell you really what I know because of what yeah. I have access to. So, yeah, I think, that you know, it, it's a great conversation. I think there's a lot more we can talk about um, just about how people are feeling and just how we're communicating. But I think a lot more needs to be done and just unconventional communication, because what we are doing now is conventional. It's expected. And it's not actually being effective, because what you want is effective communication. Mm. Moki Makura, um, so good to speak to you. Um, I'm glad you could join me today. I hope you'll come back so we can keep this yeah. conversation going, because there's a lot more to drill down to. So so thank right. you. Thank you so much. Thank Peace you for you. giving me the opportunity to put on makeup and wear a nice top for the first time in two weeks. We've got another <laughs> two weeks to go. And then they, right. they say, we'll get, we'll get you to do it again. Some more okay, makeup. Okay, in the next okay. few well done. It's a great show, by the way. Well done. Thank for doing you. It. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Take care Bye. now. Bye. Um, I love that conversation with Mookie. It was so insightful about how we have to be unconventional. We have to drill down beyond that whole national level and drill down to almost a community level to really understand the the communities we're speaking to, to really understand their priorities, you know, which is to eat, which is to survive this moment. And we have to find ways to break through that together to maintain the social distancing in the absence of water <laughs> so, to, to give them what they need to, to, to be able to look after themselves. So oh, really fascinating, yeah. really, oh, yeah, you've seen the preview. really helpful. And I hope you, you, you took a lot away from it and we'll get it back on the show. Okay. Um, now, every day on, on the show, we, we think it's important to pause and acknowledge um, the lives lost to the coronavirus. Um, this pandemic is wreaking havoc across the world and leaving holes in the lives of so, so many people. Um, we feel it's important to remember the Africans who lose the battle.
um, and share what we know of them. Um, so we want to tell you about Jean-Joseph Mukendi Wa Mulumba. Um, he was a top legal aide to the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo and reports uh, are out there that he contracted the virus while he was in France for a medical checkup. He championed several human rights causes in Congo. Um, an activist there, Aneki van Wundenberg, said on Twitter he was one of the greats. His country and the human rights movement will miss him. Just to give you some perspective, the global death toll currently stands at more than 82,000 people have lost their lives in this pandemic around the world. More than 600 of those lives lost were in Africa. We send our thoughts and prayers to all those who have lost loved ones and um, pray for but their strength to, to continue. Um, this is a difficult time for everyone, um, but we are thinking of you. Now, the need for safe and credible information is paramount right now. Um, you heard me say it at the top of the show, social media websites are struggling to tamp down the bad information that is popping up on their platforms and they can barely keep up. Um, the need to separate fact from fiction is absolutely crucial uh, for people's personal safety, for community safety, for, for, for national safety. And so I'm so pleased that we have with us um, a friend of the show, Dr. Nicolette Lewis-Saint. Um, she's the Executive Director of Healthcare Ready. She joins us from Washington. Um, Dr. Nicolette, so good to have you with us once more. How are you? Good to see you. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I haven't put on makeup or a fancy dress today, but I'm I have to say, I looked up and I was like, she's looking good. She's just like, she's like, you know, some days, I mean, I'm wearing my glasses. That just tells you where we are in the week. Exactly. That tells you where we are. Like, but whenever you see me in my glasses on the show, you know where we are in the week. Exactly. Um, so listen, let me ask you this, this, this first general question about this whole rise or surge of bad information right now. What do you make of it? So it's it's amazing to see how much bad information is getting out. And it's crazy because the same exact portals that we're using to get good information out are also getting bad information. And part of the challenge that we're seeing at least is that as the science is evolving and there are a couple papers that are coming out and things of that nature, it's not even just misinformation as it relates to rumors that are spreading, but misinterpretation of the science. And to me, that's even more dangerous. I know WhatsApp, for example, which we all use in our communities to push information, um, is trying to do a little bit more to be able to pull misinformation. Um, and that's actually something that to me is a big concern because I get more of that on WhatsApp than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but it's there's an opportunity, I think, that, that some folks have seen right now. It's also tracking with cyber attacks. Unfortunately, I know a lot of people whose banks, their bank accounts have been hacked as well. Really? So yeah, so there's even in this moment where we're all, I think it's a very sober, sobering moment for us. There's still a lot of people who unfortunately are taking advantage. Mm. So some of this is an exploitation of the lack of trust. Yes, it exists between, um, let's say specifically communities of color mm -hmm. and the authorities. And that's, you know, here in the United States and, you know, to degrees mm -hmm. in countries on the continent. Talk to me about that, 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 that gap in trust and yeah, what yeah. that means for this moment. So I think there are two things and we see them both here and in the continent. There's a lack of trust and there's a lack of representation. So when it comes to the lack of trust, there's a long history when you think about especially medically related experiences that people have between the government or the United States government and people of color. And right now, there's still no trust. So as we're talking about something that is new, something that is relatively invisible, um, therapies that are experimental, possible clinical trials, there's still not a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that we've seen is Dr. Fauci has almost internationally become the one person that everyone said, well, I trust him. 
he's speaking to me plainly. But when you don't have that trust, especially with something that's this new, it's dangerous because you end up in a situation where there's really important information to be shared, like social distancing. Think Mm -hmm. about how long it took us to wrap our minds around the fact that we all, whether we have symptoms or not, had to socially distance. I think Idris Elba did more Mm -hmm. to get people to socially distance than a lot of elected officials. Well, and and to piggyback on that point about what Idris Elba was able to do, he was also able to break through this erroneous perception that we talked about the very first time you were on the show, that Africans don't get this, right? Right. That somehow Africans are immune to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And Idris, by coming out and saying, listen, I've got this, you know, I feel poorly, but thankfully, you know, I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. I think that 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 broke so many barriers to understanding and willingness to accept the information. It did. It did. Because before that, it was a bunch of people we've never really seen before and Tom Hanks. I think Tom Hanks was the other celebrity mm-hmm. that said I was infected. But like you said, there was a lot of the sun is going to kill the virus so we don't have to worry about, you know, it infecting Af- Africans and it's not going to come to the continent because people of color aren't getting it. And it's and and to me, when he went on a camera and said, I'm infected and this is how I'm feeling and in this is what I'm doing and I'm staying inside and I'm talking to authorities and I'm calling my doctor. He didn't say he went to the doctor. He said, I'm calling my doctor. That went a long way to helping people to actually put a face that they trusted with what to do and how to handle this outbreak. And so. Yeah. I think it's a good thing, but I also think it tells us about how we relate to the people who are in authority, who are going to be giving us scientific information about what to do or explaining policies. There's still not enough trust. And that, as you said, that gap is what allows for us to continue to rely on misinformation and seeing it spread in the way that it has. Well, then we take one step forward with, you know, a moment like Idris coming out and saying he has coronavirus. And then you flip the page and you have two French doctors on TV saying, let's go test vaccines on Africans before anyone else. I mean, how damaging was that, again, as we talk about, you know, a response to this, this disease? It was catastrophic. I mean, it because at this point, knowing that there isn't a therapy, to me, that was a moment that undid any bit of trust that the WHO, Dr. Chedros, especially as a black man, as an Ethiopian, is coming in and saying, this is what we're doing, this is how hard we're working. And it undid so much of that. And so now anything that could be a helpful therapy has to overcome the barrier of what was just done there. And Mm -hmm. I think the sad part is that the WHO actually has protocols for this. And if we let Dr. Tedros lead the way on this, there was an opportunity to have a different type of message Mm -hmm. and to actually have it being taken up. And I think as hard as he's been working to actually tell the truth and explain what they're doing and talk about things like the studies and what medicines can be used, what therapies are being discussed and explored, that would have been the right carrier of the message. Mm -hmm. But So I do want to ask you this though, because, because it was kind of laid bare by these suggestions made by the French doctors. Is there there a robust framework and safeguards in place to protect um, volunteers in Africa? Should they, you know, should the option of a vaccine trial emerge um, and be put to them? Are you confident enough that the framework, the safeguards, the protocols are robust and effectively monitored to, pre- to prevent coercion or exploitation of Africans in the event of any vaccine trials? In a properly managed and sponsored clinical trial, yes. I think what's important is to make sure that the clinical trial actually has to be a proper clinical trial. Mm-hmm. It's not enough to just say this is a candidate and we're going to put it into these populations and see what happens. No, that's not a clinical trial. 
that that's a poorly done experiment. But a clinical trial actually has it has protocols. Those protocols are approved by the WHO, the sponsoring organization, organizations like Gavi mm -hmm. and others that we know have been doing this work and been trying to do this work properly for many years. CEPI is another organization that is working specifically on epidemics. Um, it's a coalition for epidemics um, preparedness initiative, I believe. But mm -hmm. though, when it's done properly, yes. But I think it's important to know that there are ways to do it right. And we have to make sure that we're holding everyone accountable to doing those studies right. And we actually have those issues in the United States as well right Very now much. with some of those candidate products that are being discussed. And there are a lot of people in, in my field that are raising you know, the alarm and saying, wait a second, we, we don't have enough science yet. And so we have to make sure that it is a sponsored study that is being done properly, that is in line with the international standards and approved by the WHO. Mm -hmm. And if those things aren't in place, then it's not a proper trial. Um, last question to you, um, as you have followed, you know, the week and where we're at, um, I know that you're following the science and what's emerging. Um, what has stood out to you that you feel people should have as a takeaway in terms of uh, breakthroughs or questions answered? Uh, what, what do you want to leave people with? I think we're starting to see the benefit of the stay at home, the social distancing and all of that. What we don't know is how many cases are yet to be uncovered. Um, so I think to me, the breakthrough is that the simplest thing, which is stay at home, keep people socially distanced, seems to be the thing that is working the best right now. And I think we, we really need to hold on to that and not see a gradual dip as a sign that we should be able to resume life as normal. To me, that's important. Um, the other thing is that we're approaching Holy Week. And so for all of us across the globe, this is a really important time to make sure that we are not doing the, the, the things that we would routinely do in this, in this holiday season. And I know that that's painful for many people, but just the act of being able to funeralize people with dignity right now is difficult. And the desire to see a holiday that you could celebrate in a normal way is very compelling. And so for us, we are very concerned about what that looks like and how we're able to allow people to feel as if there's some sense of normalcy in this holiday, especially one as sacred as this, mm -hmm. um, but also recognizing that there are dangers to getting a little too comfortable in the fact that we're starting to see improvements and going back to our way of life. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think those are the, the right points to leave everyone thinking about. So Dr. Nicolette lewis saying, always a pleasure. I'm so glad you're a friend of the show. Um, come back again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Be safe. Take care. Um, so you heard it there from um, from the good doctor. Um, we are making progress and we're seeing certainly right here in the United States and really around the world that where they have put in place these stay at home measures, where they're restricting movement, where people are following the social distancing guidelines, they are working. So that's really important. And again, an acknowledgement that this is Holy Week and so many um, people um, are, you know, thinking about Easter and there's Ramadan and that it has started and we just really need people to to really find innovative ways of being observant while also um, following the health guidelines so that, you know, we can get through this, get past this and, and you know, life as we know it can can re-begin or start once more. Um, some viewer comments that are coming in. Um, see lots of people from Sierra Leone. Uh, seems to be a repeated question from Mohammed Kamara asking why why I don't want to work in Sierra Leone. That's a conversation for another day. Never said I didn't. Um, this one from um, Joseph Kanu. Aisha, what do you have to say about these Chinese doctors that have just arrived in Nigeria? How do you see it? I, again, I'm. This is for those who don't know. Um, the Nigerian government reached out for um, support from the Chinese government. I actually don't know if they reached out, it was offered, but have accepted um, assistance from, from the Chinese um, with regards to shaping their coronavirus response, which has caused some amount of discomfort amongst some in Nigeria. I, you know, I, I want to get more details as to what it is that they're bringing to the situation that 
is absent till now. Um, and we will be getting someone on from Nigeria to kind of explain the thinking behind this move. Um, so I'm going to hold judgment till I get more information. Um, Suleiman Diallo feels very strongly in the opposite way. He says we need to kick all Chinese doctors with Western doctors because all of them have the same plan to finish us. Back to... Um, Again, the fear that, that we were talking about and the lack of trust. Um, I certainly think that we, we want to be careful when we start putting out statements like this. I think this is a time for um, cooperation, for transparency, for sharing of information, which some parts of the world have greater access to than others. So I don't think we should be, this is not a time to be building up walls and pushing people away. I think it's a, a time for us to work together, but also to maintain transparency and to ask questions. Um, so that's what I have to say to that. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Please keep them coming in. Your voice is absolutely critical. What you think is important. So please write as often as you like. We'll try and get to them as many of those comments as we can throughout the show. Thank you to everyone who's written in today. All your comments are very much appreciated. Okay. Turning now to um, an inspirational story out of Liberia, that country, like many, has time and time again displayed its resilience. Um, most recently, you may remember that it was one of three countries alongside my home country of Sierra Leone and neighboring Guinea at the heart of the battle with um, Ebola back in 2014. Um, so it's a country that we know for its strength and its ability to overcome. Um, that nation's president, George Weir, has now declared a state of emergency in light of the coronavirus. And that is to begin on Friday. Um, currently, excuse me, currently there are more than 30 confirmed cases and four deaths at least. That's what we know of. Um, I think the thing to point out is that in this moment, people are gripped with confusion and they're gripped by fear. And we see that because there's so much bad information and people just don't know where to turn. But in the midst of this confusion, we also see everyday heroes emerging. Ordinary men and women who are stepping up to help those in need, who are stepping to, to support and to make a difference. And we want to shine a spotlight on those everyday heroes on this show. So I'm so pleased to welcome Arshel Bernard. She's the owner of the Bombshell Factory in Monrovia, where workers there are doing their part to make a difference. Arshel, welcome. Thank you so much for talking to me. I'm so excited to chat with you today. I'm so excited that you're here and you look so beautiful in your head wrap and, and your t-shirt. You bring some much needed color to this. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we African women like to shine. I, listen, I support it and shine we shall. Talk to me about your factory and the critical work that's being done there. Yes. Well, my factory opened after the Ebola crisis ended. So we opened in 2016 and we work with women who were affected by Ebola and so when coronavirus was coming, I started to get scared and I just paid everybody their salaries. And I was like, look, I will keep you guys on salary as long as we can afford to. But I need you all to go home because we've seen this before. As you just yeah. talked about with Ebola, I already know that the Liberian healthcare system is so fragile and not really equipped to handle something as contagious as the coronavirus. So I told them, let's close the factory. Let's just go sit home. And they told me no. They said no to you. They told me no. My women um, said, you know what? Well, we can do stuff to help. We have all of this Lapa. That's what we call the African wax. We have all this Lapa sitting here. And we had already bought supplies for the summer. Why don't we use the elastic and make these masks? One of our employees who we pay for data because she likes you know, YouTube and Google, she found an African print mask. And she was like, let me just try it. And two hours later, she had made 10 given them yeah. to the people in the yard where our, um, where our factory is. And then I just put it up online and I told our community, I reached out to our community around the world and I said, listen, this is a way that we can ensure that our women keep their salaries and also that we're doing something to successfully beating coronavirus and moving it from fragile Liberia. And so people just kept donating $5, $5, $5. So we've been able to make over 200 masks that we can then distribute freely to people in our community, starting with our healthcare workers. Because what people don't understand in America is these N95 masks, 
mm-hmm. are they're more common here than they are in Liberia. So our first big order was people at the big hospital that dealt with Ebola. So we are getting our cloth masks are going to be the first line of defense for some of the healthcare workers in Liberia. So that meant a lot to me. I was going to say, I'm getting goosebumps as you tell me this story, Um, because I do want to ask you, what what does it mean for you to be able to help in this moment? Liberian women have always been first stubborn. Yes, but fearless, you know. Um, we have a couple of Liberians on this production team. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. And they'll shake their heads too when they hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that for me, I was very nervous. I want to take care of my women. I want everybody to be safe. And I don't want to hear of anything happening to them. But I have to know, and I should have known, that they were never going to go down without a fight. Like we would always be the ones to say, no, 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 we have this capability. So let's do everything that we can. So it means to me that, number one, I work with some women who are very very high integrity, and they're saying we're not going to see anything else come because war came, Ebola came. This will not come and ruin us. So um, every day we get status updates. All right, we've done another 200. Okay, we've done some more. Where can we distribute these? So it's very exciting for me. Um, you know what it also says to me that I, you know, I want to spotlight? It is that what you're doing is directly disproving, directly challenging the narrative that as Africans, we're always waiting for people to come and save us. We're always yeah. waiting for people to provide the solutions to our own problems. You are showing that that is not the case. You're absolutely right. I, I, I have always believed that if given the opportunity we, to sink or swim, we would swim. We are able. We, we can dig deep and make a way out of no way. This is what I truly have always believed a Liberian woman could do. Um, And just in a situation like this, they're proving me right. Mm. So so we're just going to keep at it. Um, State of emergency, as you said, starts tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have talked with City Hall about trying to make sure that we are considered emergency personnel because my women don't want to stop making masks and distributing them. So as as we try to keep our community safe, we want to make sure that we're doing every single thing that we can. Mm-hmm. What do you say to those people, be they um, here in the United States, wherever they may be watching us from, or even in Liberia, who are saying, I want to help. I don't know how. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do I start? What do you say yeah. to them? Well, that was, I think, why we were so successful was because so many people really want to help and they don't know where to start. And so for us, if they want to help like our efforts, they're just simply donating and that gets a mask to somebody in the community. And I think that there are a lot of people who are really trying to dig deep and find solutions like that. And so even if I can't go out because maybe I'm high risk or I live with somebody who's high risk, just aligning yourselves with causes that are important to you. We had so many people who work in healthcare in America who said, I know that this is going to get crazy. And so I want to make sure that I can do whatever I can to help people in a country where they may never visit, mm-hmm. people that they will never meet. And I think it's just so important that we see kindness because we have to save the world. We can't just save ourselves. Agreed. What, what comes next? I mean, when you look forward, are you able to look forward in, in, into, into the future right now? I mean, obviously the factory, um, you know, has been around for a while and it's doing this now. I mean, talk to me about, you know, how you imagine a, a future right now. Yeah, well, in the future, number one, I'm just, I, I get so nervous when I think about coronavirus spreading because I already know that it hasn't spread as much as, much as it will in Liberia, especially in a place where social distancing will not look like what it looks like in America. Yeah. Um, nobody on our staff even has power or cold storage to be able to keep food refrigerated. So they have to buy food every day. So just in the marketplace alone, that's going to be an issue. But I'm hoping that we will keep some of the hygiene principles that we're learning now in place where everybody is washing their hands and everybody is conscious of that. And I'm just hoping that we can fight this together so that we can reopen as normal. You know, I want all of our women to be able to go back to making dresses and nice fun things and, and feel that's what you did every before time. this, right? Yeah. Yeah. We were making dresses and, 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 and skirts and lots of wonderful things, but I want to make sure that um, they can always leave their home feeling safe coming to work, feeling safe, and then knowing that there's an impact to be made. Well, Ashal, we are proud of you. You you are one of our heroes. Thank you.
work you're doing. Um, thank you for standing up in the community um, and inspiring us and, and everyone watching. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Arthur Bernard there. Um, what an inspiring note to end the show on. Um, proof that we all in our own small ways or even big ways can make a difference in this moment. It's a moment for all of us to come together um, as Africans to, to help not just our those we know, our own loved ones, but to do our part um, beyond our circle to help make a difference, to help end this crisis, wherever you're watching from. Whether you're African, even if you're not, that's that's irrespective. We're all human. We all have a role to play. And I'm calling on everyone after such an inspirational conversation with Archel that we look to see what we can do without, you know, I don't, I'm not asking anyone to put themselves in danger. Please don't go out and, 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 and get hurt or, or fall ill. But how can you help in this moment? What can you do? I know one thing you can all do right now maintain the social distancing guidelines, wash your hands as, as often as you are able to stay safe. That's absolutely critical. And remember that we will get through this. I can't tell you when, I don't think any of us have the answer to that, but we will get through this, but it's going to take all of us doing our own part, following the guidelines and, and thinking not just of ourselves, but uh, of others. I think it's absolutely critical. And also the other thought that I want to leave you with today is the importance of communicating effectively and communicating the right information. There is so much bad information out there right now and it can really hurt. It can really hurt people. It can really um, have a negative effect on our attempts to get the situation under control. So I ask you all to be responsible also in the information that you're sharing, in the information that you're putting forward as truth when a lot of it is just rumor and supposition and false. So let's all be mindful of that. Let's all be mindful, you know, as you start to think of what you can do, one of the things you can do is be careful with the information you are spreading right now about this pandemic. We've all got to do our part. So that's something you, we, you can do right now. And you can also share the show. Spread the word. Um, Home with Aisha to say every day, Monday through Friday, I'll be here speaking to people, making a difference, people with great insight about what is happening on the continent and um, how we can do better and how we can come together to overcome this difficult moment. Keep your comments coming. Um, they're, they're still coming in. Thank you for all the kindness from Sarah Leonians who are writing in and expressing um, support of me. That means a lot. Um, so thank you to Ahmed Jal to Marian Talamato Cabo, thank you. Um, Florence Kay also wrote in asking, why do you think, uh, what do you think about the 5G rumors going around the world? I think it's false. I think it's harmful. And, you know, again, I want people to think closely and, and, and think carefully about the information that they're spreading. So please keep writing in. Your voice is absolutely critical for the show. Your voice is the lifeblood. It's why we get up. It's why people um, across this country, uh, in terms of this production team, because we're spread out. It's why we're working on the show, because we want to have a conversation with you and we want to help. This is how we are doing our part in this moment of crisis. So please support, please spread the word about the show. Please share the clips so we can get more people watching and more people involved in the conversation. Um, but that's it for me today. Um, I'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. There's nowhere else to go. I'm still locked up in LA, approaching three weeks now. Um, so I'll be here tomorrow with more great guests, more great conversations. And so please, please keep your comments coming. And I hope to see you right here then. Till then, bye for now.